Hey man, thank you back. so much, idiot. Household choir. Oh, you guys do a good right. job. Let's go, boy, I didn't get a chance to pray Let's go, bro. to you go, bro. tonight for our NorCal Campus devotional. Uh, please join me in a quick word of prayer before we on, get bro. into other scriptures. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much for a Friday night like this. That even in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic, that um, even though many of us are huddled uh, in front of our computer screens and some of us on our phone, uh, that God Almighty, we can have safe refuge and comfort in the arms of the living God. Thank you so much that with all the chaos and the craziness going on, that God, by faith, if we can sit still at the feet of the throne room of God, we'll receive all the comfort, all the peace, all the grace, all the mercy that we need to make it through this time. And I pray even at this time that you speak to us. Speak to us from your scriptures to give us the word of encouragement, to give us the word of courage, to give us the word of strength, the word of faith that we need to hear tonight, that we'll all be transformed, Father in heaven, that we'll be the men and women that you need us to be for this generation, for this time, because indeed it's for such a time as this that you put us on the face of this planet. I pray that you speak to us in a powerful way. It's in Jesus' name have we prayed. Amen. 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 Well, turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter 11. Uh, Let's go, bro. It's kind of cool. Let's go, Craig. To the word to uh, the campus ministry in Northern California tonight. Uh, we're going to be jumping in here at uh, Luke, chapter 11, and we'll see what the Lord has for us to hear. In Luke, chapter 11, verse 1, we read these words. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Just as John taught his disciples, he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, but we also forgive everyone who sins against us and lead us not into temptation. Let's pause there real quick. This is a, a day in the life of Jesus. And it says that he is with his disciples and he basically separates himself for a time so he can go and pray. And it says his disciples basically were observing him as he's praying and it just didn't interrupt them. They just kind of waited for him. And when he was done praying, they approached him and they're like, hey, Lord, could you teach us to pray the way that John taught his disciples to pray? Because we've been watching you pray and we want to be able to imitate you in your prayer life. We have noticed that the power that you get from God to do the miracles and to preach the word comes as a result of your prayer life. We want that as well. So teach us to pray just as you are praying. What's incredible yeah. about this passage is because sometimes we ask the question, well, Jesus' apostles slash disciples were all Jewish men. So there were men who had been raised up in Judaism. They had the temple. They had the offerings and they were basically familiar with God and, for, and prayer with God. So why would they ask Jesus at this advanced stage in age that they are to teach them to pray? Yes. One, one answer is that super humble. Two, yes, indeed. They want to be able to pray like Jesus. Three, yes, indeed. They want to be able to be as effective at doing the work of the Lord like Jesus was. And so they wanted to be able to imitate him as a prayer, which is true. But one of the foundational reasons why the disciples asked Jesus to pray is because just like we said, they had actually grown up in Judaism. And in Judaism, people did not have a personal, intimate relationship with God. They knew God as the Jehovah God, the almighty God who sat up on high like a king. And so us common people, just as you're, you have zero rights to approach the king, the common average Jew was like, hey, God is the king of kings, the exalted father and God. There's no way I can approach him. There's no way I can have audience with him. Good a slight point, tangent. That's the reason why it was such a big deal when Jesus died on the cross, the curtain in the temple was ripped in half. It was to be a sign to the Jewish people, primarily, and to everybody, that now the throne room of God was open through the body of Christ, and so all of us could approach the throne room of God. We can approach God. Now the King of kings and the Lord of lords desires to have audience with us. So now back to Luke 11. This is basically the life in which the disciples, Jewish people, were living. They basically had no 
thought of how they could approach God, how each individual could have a personal relationship with God. What they were used to was, depending on where you lived, you made a yearly or annually pilgrimage from wherever you lived to the temple in Jerusalem, and you came bearing the offering. Either you were a poor person and you came with doves, or you're rich enough to have a ram or a goat or a sheep, and you brought it as your offering, and the priest would take it from you, and then they'll kill it, and they'll offer it, and then you go back to your town. And so their relationship with God, the interaction with God, was based on what the priest would tell them. And so when they saw in Jesus this incredible rabbi, this new teacher, who had a personal relationship with God, who didn't rely on the priests, didn't rely on temple worship for his connection with God, for his prayer life. They're like, we want that too. We want to be able to talk to God as freely, as openly as you are able to. And so they asked Jesus to teach them to pray. And so Jesus calls them around him and he says, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread, forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us and lead us not into temptation. Obviously, it's cool because Jesus says, when you pray and not if you want to pray. What's the expectation? That as disciples, as followers of Jesus, as believers in God, that we would pray consistently because God desires to have an intimate relationship with us. Obviously, what's amazing is we have a bigger right and a bigger audience with God in our prayers than even the disciples had at this point in time because Jesus hadn't died yet. But more than that, Jesus gives them this template of how to approach God. That yes, they actually have to show reverence and respect for God. And they also had to come before God with their needs. And they also had to pray to God knowing that they had to forgive those who sinned against them so they too may receive forgiveness of sins. What's quite interesting is that for many of us, when we read this passage in Luke 11, we didn't really recognize the prayer that Jesus is telling them to pray. Because most of us are more familiar with the King James version of this prayer. The Lord's prayer as is known or the Our Father, which goes something like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I can Come on, see bro. you smiling because you're like, yeah, I remember that prayer. I prayed a thousand times when I was younger before I was even a disciple. Every time I got into trouble, every time I was yeah. about to get a sleep, yeah. every time yeah. I was about to take a test, yes. every time I was driving my car and I saw the flashing lights of the cops behind me. Oh, yeah, yeah I remember that prayer. Oh, yeah. yes. Come on, bro. But as we see in Luke 11, Jesus didn't teach his disciples to pray this prayer in order for them to memorize it and to recite it. It was a template. It was a formula of how to build a relationship with God and how to have a prayer life, a conversation with God. How do we know? Because there's nowhere else in the Bible during the life of Jesus or the life of the apostles or the disciples in the first century where this prayer is repeated word for word or verbatim. Because the disciples understood it was a template. And so what's incredibly sad is that the disciples asked Jesus to teach them to pray so they could run away from this, the dead stake re relationship or religion of Judaism. And so he gives them this formula of, to have a relationship with God. And sadly, the Catholic Church, which first basically professed this prayer, has actually turned it into a rote memorized prayer for people to pray when they're in trouble and which stops people from actually having an intimate relationship with God. It's so crazy that the very prayer that oh, Jesus bro. taught his disciples so they could break away from Judaism and memorization and the monotony has actually been used and turned into a prayer that most people memorize. And it blocks them from actually having a relationship with God. Wow. Come on, bro. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Come on. It so shows bro. the on, work bro. of Satan in our world today. And so today, I thought we would investigate this prayer. But in investigating this prayer, I thought we would just settle in on the one 
request, the first request that Jesus puts there in that prayer. And just in case you're wondering what it was, it is give us this day our daily bread. And that is the title of our lesson tonight. Give us Come this on. day our daily oh, bread. When Jesus gave his disciples the template of how to pray and to approach God, he actually tells them, you start with reverence and respect and honor for God before you even have a request for God, which is an incredible thing for all of us to learn because if I'm honest, most of us begin our prayers with everything we want to complain about, everything that's going wrong, and everything we want to ask God for. Before I've been thinking about humbly honoring and respecting and revering God. Many of us come before God with all our problems and requests and complaints before we think about praising God and honoring God. And so today we're going to start with the first request. Give us this day our daily bread. Turn me to Exodus chapter 16. Come on, bro. Our first point. It's awesome, bro. Manna in the morning. Woo! There it is. Exodus. This. Yes. Give us this day our daily bread. Sing it, bro. Exodus 16. Sing it, bro. Verse 1 says, the whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin. It's a place you don't want to stay. Which is between Elam and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I'll rain down bread from heaven for you. The people have to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I'll test them and see whether they'll follow my instructions. Skip on now with me to verse 11. The Lord said to Moses, I've heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them, at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you'll be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. That evening quail came down and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, what's this? What's it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, it is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Each one is to gather as much as he needs. Take an omer for each person you have in your tent. The Israelites did as they were told. Some gathered much, some little. And when they measured it by the omer, he, he who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little did not have too little. Each one gathered as much as he needed. Then Moses said to them, no one is to keep any of it until morning. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses. They kept part of it until morning, but it was full of maggots and began to smell. So Moses was angry with them. Let's pause there. Our first point, manner in the morning. This is the first rendition in the Bible where we find God providing bread for his people. So in a sense, when Jesus was teaching his disciples to pray and he says to them, give us this day our daily bread, for the Jewish man, this is what was going to come into their mind. Manna in the morning. That when God, through the hands of Moses, had rescued over 2 million Jews from Egypt, brought them through the Red Sea and encamped them in the desert, the first thing they did was to complain. The first thing they did was to grumble. The first thing they did was to look back at their bondage, at their slavery in Egypt that they had left. Why? Because they were hungry. And they looked around at the desert and they were like, how are we going to get food? And immediately they forgot all the incredible miracles that God had done with the 10 plagues in Egypt, the incredible miracle of crossing through the Red Sea on dry ground. And they began to grumble against God and against Moses. They tell Moses like, why didn't God just kill us up in Egypt? Why didn't he just murder all of us up in Egypt where we sat around pots of food and we had everything we want? Sadly, that's not even true. There were slaves in Egypt. They were looking back on their past slavery, and in the light of their pain of today, they actually not only misremembered what had gone on in their past, they were actually deceived about their life 
in Egypt. So they grumble against Moses and they grumble against God. And in response, God says, it's okay. I'll give them bread to eat. We're in the middle of a desert. Nothing can grow here, but I'll give them bread. He says, but this is what I'm going to do. They are to pick up an omer per person each day. Basically, Monday through Friday. Sorry, Sunday through Friday. Because their first day of the week was Sunday. And everybody's to gather as much as they want. Don't gather any extra and try and save it for tomorrow because we'll have maggots in it. But the day before the Sabbath, grab two extra. Well, an extra because on Sabbath, nobody's supposed to work and there'll be no manna. And then save it for the next day. And God says, I'm going to give them manna to eat, but I'm going to test them to see if they're going to trust me and if they're going to obey me. And that's exactly what happened. Moses tells the people, they go to bed, very next morning with the dew is thin flakes on the desert floor. And the people are like, what is it? And that's what they translate as manna for us in English. And Moses says, this is the bread that God promised to give you. Sadly, the people didn't obey because some people grabbed more than they needed for that day. Why would they do that? Because they didn't trust God. Boom. And so the next morning, Come on, bro. they woke up and there was maggots in it. And the whole place was smelly and bad. And it says Moses was angry with the people. It's sad to see that these are the same people that God had done miracle upon miracle upon miracle. Yet it didn't touch their heart. They had no trust no faith in God. Why is any of that important? Because it helps us to see that the incredible miracles that God does in our lives, he does it, yes, to bless us. He does it, yes, to take care of us. But he also uses them as a test to see if we're going to build faith, to see if our hope in him, our trust in him is going to grow so that when the next test comes, we're not going to grumble. We're not going to complain. We're not going to get discouraged. We're going to stand and we're going to have faith in our God. Come on, bro. Sadly, much like the Israelites, we fail test after test after test after test. Why? Because just like the Israelites, we're refusing to put our hope in God. We're refusing to trust God. We're refusing to have faith in God. Why? Because we trust in ourselves. Come on, Kwaku. Come on, bro. God is trying to wean you and me from the sin of trusting in ourselves and trusting in man so we can actually have true faith, true trust, true obedience to the living God. And so that's why when Jesus teaches his disciples to pray, he says, hey, you need to pray and ask God, give us this day our daily bread. Implying y'all has got to pray every single day. And in the same heart and mind that God was trying to institute in the disciples, you got to trust God every single day and have faith in him every single day that he's got you no matter what's going on around you. Are you with me, church? Let's go, Quay. Come on, bro. Let's go. Let's go. Come on. Let's go. Good morning. Amazing points, bro. God gives us enough faith, enough hope in his word to last us for a day. That's why in Matthew 6, we don't have the time to go there. It says, sufficient for each day is the trouble therein. What does that mean? Each day has enough trouble of its own. God is trying to build up our faith so that no matter comes our way, we will be okay. Why is any Hi. of this important? I think about what's going on in our lives today. School has started, things are picking up, there's midterms going on. And what I keep hearing from many of the campus disciples is we're overwhelmed, we have too much homework, we have midterms coming, I got a job, you're trying to get me to share my faith, you're trying to get me to be in Bible studies. It's too much, it's too much, it's too much. I can't, I can't, I can't handle all of this. And it's like, where did our faith go? Where did our trust go? Come on, bro. And God is trying to get our attention, just like he did with the Israelites. He's like, guys, think for a moment. Have I ever let you down? Have you ever starved before? Wow. No. 
Have you died in a car crash yet? No. Oh, hey, think about it. You know how two semesters ago you had midterms, but you didn't die? You actually kind of survived it? What do you think is going to happen this midterm? Come on, bro. I'll give you a guess. You're going to be okay. Come on, bro. Come on, Kwaku. You remember six months ago when you're like, oh, Yo, no. I have no idea how I'm going to pay rent. Like, shoot, this is it. I ain't got more money. I'm going to be homeless. I'm going to be on the street. Yeah. Someone's going to be asking me for dope. I'm going to be shooting up dope. It's over. I'm going to live in the street. And God is like, um, hey, real quick. Where do you live now? <laughs> oh, right. You have a roof over your head. You actually didn't go homeless. I see. So, um, you know how you're struggling for October rent? Let me give you like one guess. What do you think? What do you think I'm going to do for you? What do you think is going to happen? It's just like the, the new Temple Sisters House of San Francisco shared at just the right time when they needed a new place to live. God dropped an apartment in their laps, bigger than the one they used to have, better than the one they used to have. God calls that manna in the morning. Go with me to Psalm 78. Come on, bro. Let's go, Kwaku. Let's go, Kwaku. Come on, Kwaku. Come on, Kwaku. Verse 9 says, The men of Ephraim, though armed with bows, turned back on the day of battle. They did not keep God's co covenant and refused to live by his law. They forgot what he had done, the wonders he had shown them. He did miracles in the sight of their fathers in the land of Egypt, in the region of Zon. He divided the sea and led them through. He made the water stand firm like a wall. He guided them with a cloud by day and with light from the fire all night. He split the rocks in the desert and gave them water as abundant as the seas. He brought streams out of a rocky crag and made water flow down like rivers. But they continued to sin against him, rebelling in the desert against the Most High. They willfully put God to the test by demanding the food they craved. They spoke against God, saying, Can God spread a table in the desert? When he struck the, water, the rock, water gushed out and streams flowed abundantly. But can he also give us food? Can he supply meat for this people? When the Lord heard them, he was very angry. His fire broke out against Jacob, and his wrath rose against Israel. For they did not believe in God or trust in his deliverance. Yet he gave a command to the skies above and opened the doors of the heavens. He rained down manna for the people to eat. He gave them the grain of heaven. Men ate the bread of angels. He sent them all the food they could eat. Psalm 78 is an amazing psalm because it details for us the entire history of the Israelites from Egypt all the way into the desert. And he puts it out there. He's like, after all the incredible miracles that God did for the Israelites, they still continued to sin against him. They willfully put God to the test by demanding the food they crave. They're like, okay, okay. Um, can God put a table up in here in the desert for us to eat? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. He struck the rock and water came out. That's pretty cool. But can you do food though? And it says, the anger of God burned against them. Our faithlessness, according to the Bible, angers God. And it makes sense. How do I know? Because for many of us, when we read the Old Testament and we read the story of the Israelites, a lot of times we're like, wow, these people were like really faithless and bad. What's sad is, Whenever we read the Old Testament and we make that statement about the Israelites, we're calling ourselves hypocrites because we're doing the exact same thing they do. Come on, bro. So true. When we allow the circumstances we are living in to freak us out, to make us give in to our sin and not to go to God, when, when we look around us and there's chaos and we freak out, instead of standing firm in our faith in God and trusting in the deliverance Trust of God, we're doing the exact same thing they did. And so we're hypocrites if we think they're faithless. Come on, bro. It's true. What's the point of all of this? God on, wants bro. us to change. Come on, bro.
He wants you Go, and I to be the faithful men and women that he can point to and say, those are my children. Let's go. That even when the waters of the sea rage against them, they stand their ground on the rock, which is Jesus Christ, and they don't even butt an eyelid because they're like, I'm going to be okay. Come on, Kweku. That's the kind of disciples, faithful, strong, and powerful that God wants you and I to be. Come on, bro. The Bible teaches us in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7 that we live by faith, not by sight. What's the point? As Christians, we close our eyes to all the craziness around us because the craziness around us doesn't determine our faith level and it doesn't define us. Come on, bro. Our That's faith true. in God define us. The word of God determines our faith level. And those are the people that have manna in the morning. Everybody knows what the point is. God gave them manna in the morning because he wanted them to feed on the bread he provided every single morning. So what's the illustration? We can't skip our quiet times. We got to feed on the bread of God's word every single day. And we have to derive enough faith from God's word every single day, enough to last us the whole day. That way, when the temptation of sin and the devil come, we can look it in the face and up on an eyelid and be able to say, I'm standing on the promises of God. Come on, bro. Let's go, bro. What's the challenge? If we don't feed enough on this and get enough faith, who knows? Later on in the day, the temptation is going to come and you're going to give into it because your faith ran out. If I put half a tank of gas in my car and I try to drive to LA, I ain't going to make it. Amen, bro. It ain't because my car ain't good enough because I run out of gas. And the same thing that happens to us oh, day, after day after day. We need to make time for our quiet times. And not just to read and pray to check it off, but to dig deep in here and derive enough faith from God's word so we can get off of our quiet time and we can go and share our faith powerfully. We can be in Bible studies powerfully and make disciples. And no matter what Satan throws our way, no matter what trouble it is, when the rent is not showing up, when the boss won't give us hours at work, when we have more homework than we even have enough pens to write it on in there, we can look at it and have a smile on our face because we've had manna in the morning. Are you with me? Come on, bro. Come on, Quaku. Go, Quaku. Bro. So you want to go with me to Exodus chapter 25. Exodus 25. Let's go, Quakes. Come on, bro. Point. In verse 23, the Lord says through Moses, Make a table of acacia wood, two cubits long, a cubit wide, and a cubit and a half high. Overlay it with pure gold and make a gold molding around it. Also make around a rim and a hand breadth wide and put a gold molding on the rim. Make four gold rings and table, fasten them four corners where the four legs are. The rings are to be close to the rim to hold the poles used in carrying them. Verse 29, and make its plates and dishes of pure gold as well as its pitchers and bowls for the pouring out of offerings. Put the bread of the presence on this table to be before me at all times. Pause. In Exodus 25, God instructs Moses to build the tabernacle. It was basically going to be the physical location where God would come to commune with his people, the place which will hold, in quote, the presence of God. So don't know. And so it's like, make the temple, uh, sorry, make the tabernacle, put the lampstand in it. But I also want you to make a solid gold table. And on that table, put plates and dishes of pure gold and set before me the bread of of the presence so that the bread of the presence will be on the table before me at all times. And that's the second point, the bread of his presence. Now, obviously some of you may be asking, what the heck is the bread of his presence? For that, let's go to Levit Leviticus 24. Let's go, bro. I like nuggets, bro. What kind of Leviticus chapter 24. It says here in verse eight. 
Sorry, let's start in verse 5. It says, Leviticus 24, verse 5. Take fine flour and bake 12 loaves of bread, using two-tenths of an ephah for each loaf. Set them in two rows, six in each row, on the table of pure gold before the Lord. Along each row, put some pure incense as a memorial portion to represent the bread and to be an offering made to the Lord by fire. This bread is to be set out before the Lord regularly, Sabbath after Sabbath, on behalf of the Israelites as a lasting covenant. It belongs to Aaron and his sons who have to eat it in the holy place because the most holy part of their regular share of the offerings made to the Lord by fire, the bread of his presence. So when Moses constructs the tabernacle, he puts the lampstand in it, Ark of the Covenant, the butter staff of Aaron, the, the, the two tablets, which got written the Ten Commandments in there. What he did as well was set a solid gold table on it with gold dishes, and he's supposed to put 12 loaves of bread arranged in two groups of six. And that was the bread of the presence. It was supposed to lay on the table before God from Sabbath to Sabbath. Uh, we don't have all the time to study into it, but basically they changed the bread after every Sabbath. So basically the bread laid in front of God for a week from Sabbath to Sabbath, and then they'll switch it out and they'll put the new bread in there. And what they did with the old bread is because they had mixed it with incense and it was a memorial before God, the priest, the high priest, and his family were to eat it in the most holy place. And it was supposed to be a representative of the presence of God with his people. And so the priest would eat it on behalf of the people. Why is any of that important? Because for the entire time that the Israelites were going to be in relationship with God, he wanted them to remember the bread of his presence. Why is that important? Because... The manna in the morning, our first point, that God gave them had an end date. It was when they stepped foot into the promised land. When they got into the promised land, now they were actually able, they were not in the desert anymore. So now they could have fields, they could have farms, they could actually farm and provide food for themselves. As we have to imagine, for 40 years, God fed them. It was a desert. They couldn't grow crops. They couldn't harvest any crops. They ate manna every single day. But in the promised land, they were actually going to be able to provide food for themselves to eat. So what do you think is going to happen to, sadly, faithless people who finally can make their own food? They're quickly going to forget about God. And so what God institutes is the bread of his presence to be put in the tabernacle and then later on, when Solomon builds the temple, it would also be in the temple. It was supposed to be a constant reminder of, yes, the provision of God and what God had done in the desert for them with the manna, but it was named the bread of the presence. It was supposed to remind them of the presence of God with them every single day. Come on, bro. Awesome, bro. God wanted his people to remember for all time that he was with them. He wanted to encourage them that, yes, when you go through the fires, I'll be with you. When you go through the valley of the shadow of death, I will be with you. Because we as people so soon forget that he who is with us is greater than anything we're ever going to face. The reason this is so important is because you find out throughout the scriptures that God time and time and time and time and time again is trying to remember, remind you and I that he's with us. He's right with us, that we will not fail. We will not fall. No matter how hard things get, he's going to sit with us. It's the reason why we can imagine Paul sitting in a dungeon, chained, beaten, flogged, singing songs of praise and adoration to God. Why? Because God was sitting right next to him there in the dungeon. Go with me to Matthew, chapter 1. Let's go, Quake. Come on, bro. Come on, Matthew, chapter 1. Verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose it to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. 
But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what's conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you have to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and they'll call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Pause there. We all know the story. We're not going to go into it because we're all familiar with the Christmas story. Joseph had it in mind to divorce Mary quietly. Yes, so that she doesn't get caught and get stoned and killed. But the angel tells him, don't do that. It was conceived in hairs of the Holy Spirit. She's going to give birth to a son. You're going to call him Jesus, which is a Greek version of the name Joshua, which means savior or God saves. And it's like, yeah. The son to be born to you is going to be the savior of the world. And yes, he's the fulfillment of the scripture in Isaiah. That in the future, a son, a Messiah, a prophet will walk amongst us. And his name will be Emmanuel. Meaning God with us. Why does Jesus get that name? It's because yes, Jesus walked amongst us. He was supposed to be God with us. It was God's reminder to us, I am with you. What are you afraid of? I am with you. Why are you so anxious? I am with you. Why are you so stressed? I am with you. Why so discouraged? I am with you. And throughout the pages of the Bible, God tried to remind us that over and over and over again. But then somebody might say, but Jesus no longer walks amongst us. I got every right to be stressed out, freaked out, neurotic, and exhausted. AKA, I'm fine. Go with me to John 16. Come on, bro. Real quick. John 16. This is awesome, bro. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. This is five reasons. Now I'm going to him who sent me. Yeah, now if you ask me, where are you going? Because I've said these things, you're filled with grief. But I tell you the truth. It is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I'll send him to you. Skip on down with me to verse 12. I have much to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father's mind. That's why I said, the spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. So what's Jesus' answer to all of us? We're like, well, but Jesus don't left me here. He's like, it's good that I left so I can give you my Holy Spirit, the counselor who's going to be with you forever. Who's always going to remind you that Emmanuel, God is with us. This is one of the incredible, incredible honors that we have as disciples that when we make a decision to repent of our sins and get baptized, we get forgiveness of all our sins, past, present, and future. But God deposits in us the gift of the Holy Spirit who is in us, yes, as a seal guaranteeing our inheritance with God when he comes back to take his children. But before that time comes, we can walk here on this planet knowing every single day that the Spirit of God dwells in us. And so because of that, Emmanuel, God is with us. Come on. Come on, bro. And because we know that, and because we live with the Spirit of God with us, because we have Jesus and Emmanuel, we got nothing to be afraid of. We got nothing to be scared of. It's so amazing to live in this time of coronavirus, and there are people dying all around us. And I'm not saying that we have a cavalier attitude and we don't care about what's going on. We do care, but we know that we have God with us, so he will take care of us. He will save us. We'll be okay. I'm sure most of you have heard by now that the president has coronavirus. He got COVID-19. Yep. We've been in quarantine since March of this year. And to date, no disciple has died from COVID-19. Yes, many disciples have gotten it. 
We've shared the story before. Even our dear sister Sandra got COVID-19 while she was pregnant. She had to be put in an induced coma for two straight weeks so they could pull the baby out of her. But mother, baby, and father are okay. In the Paris church, COVID-19 went through almost half of the church, but they're all okay. Why? Because Emmanuel, God is with us. Come on, bro. Let's go, Quakes. What does God want you and I to understand? That wherever it is that we go, Emmanuel, God is with us. Jesus may not be walking amongst us physically anymore, but that's why he gave us his spirit to be a constant reminder like he's always done throughout the Old Testament into the New Testament that he is with us. Go with me to Matthew 28. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Let's go. Let's go, Kwaku. Matthew 28. It's a passage we're all super familiar with and we love so much because it's the Great Commission. And it says here in verse 18, it says, Then Jesus said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And so what's the point? This is the Great Commission. Jesus wanted to make sure that salvation could come to the ends of the earth. So he sent his disciples out. He said, go, you make disciples, you baptize them. And then you teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. And then after he utters these words, according to historical accounts, according to biblical account, he was taken up into heaven before their very eyes. And so if somebody were to ask you, what was the very last spoken word that disciples audibly heard from Jesus? before he left, it technically wasn't the Great Commission to go make disciples. Actually, it was, I'm with you always. Jesus' last words on this planet, yes, was to command us to make disciples. But it was a reassurance that he's with us. Come on, bro. God wants to encourage us and to build our faith that he's with us. Let the storms come. Let the earth quake. Let the oceans roar. Emmanuel, God, is with us to the very end of the age. Come on, bro. Come on. When I read this, it encourages me and it convicts me. Why? Because God desires so much to have an intimate relationship with us. It's so sad that even I take my quiet times for granted because God, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, desires to sit with me and talk with me, hear what's on my heart, hear what's on my mind. He, he desires for me to cast all my cares and my anxieties at his feet so I can walk away free from all of my burdens. I can walk away knowing that God is with me so I have no reason to be anxious or stressed or scared or freaked out. And we don't take advantage of it. Tonight, God is calling you and I back to have intimate relationships with him. God is calling us back to that very night when most of us got a chance to get baptized where we're like, oh my gosh, yes, all my sins are gone, but I feel like I'm standing in the presence of God. I feel like God is shining his light upon me. I feel like if I stretch my hands out deep enough, I might be able to touch the face of God. And God is saying, yes, you can. I want you to do that every single day. I want you to remember that every single day. And so Jesus' last words to the disciples, I am with you. And he goes up into the skies. Many of us are fired up to be part of a fired up fellowship of churches. But God is calling you out to have an intimate relationship with him. God is calling you and I to fall so deeply, so madly, so truly in love with God that yes, we take time to do all the other things we have to do, but we have our special time with God. It was so amazing when Tyler on Tuesday shared about Shay and how, how incredible she takes her time to be with God. She has her own prayer closet that she goes into. And it's amazing, such a great example for you and I to do. Draw close to God. 
He will be with us and he'll see us through whatever it is that Satan might want to throw at us. Let's close out in our third point. Go to John chapter six. Let's go, Quake. Third and final point. Let's go, bro. The bread of life. John chapter six. Let's start here in verse five of John chapter six. It says, when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked us only to test him for you already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, eight months wages would not buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. And of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and the men sat down, about 5,000 of them. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed them to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had, had, all, when they had all had enough to eat, he said to the disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. Let's pause it real quick. So this is when Jesus feeds the 5,000. He's been preaching. The people have been traveling with him. And so he turns to his disciples and he sees the crowd and says, hey, um, where are we going to buy bread for all these people to eat? Because they're hungry and they've been here for so long. And the Bible is amazing because it makes the point that he only asked this as a test. He already knew what he was going to do. Test of what did Philip and the other disciples have faith enough in Jesus? Today, like we're talking about, believe enough that Jesus, Emmanuel, God was with us. So everything's going to be okay. But they didn't do it. They immediately turned to themselves. And they're like, well, let me do this calculation real quick. Uh, it's going to take eight months wages to feed all of them. And we ain't got that kind of money. And Jesus says, have the people sit down. And then he multiplied the bread so everybody could eat. He's doing for them the exact same thing God had done for the Israelites. I'll give you bread to eat every single day. He's doing for them what God had done for the Israelites when he says, just take 12 loaves of bread and put it on the table every time you see it so it can remind you, I'm with you. I got you. You got nothing to be freaked out, insecure, neurotic, exhausted about. I got you. But it goes on. It says here in verse 25, John 6, 25. When they found him on the other side, because you remember, the people wanted to come make him king by force, but he slips away. Then they find him. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. You're looking for me, not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures the eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. The people come and find Jesus and would assume is that we would assume that they have faith in him now. No. Jesus is like, no, 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 no. You guys are here because you had food to eat. All you care about is food. But don't wear yourself out for food that spoils. But wear yourself out for food that will endure for eternal life. You guys know where Jesus is going here. So let's skip on to it. 32. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. It's not Moses who has given you bread from heaven, but it's my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Say, they said, from now on, give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. 
He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus wants you and I to feed upon him, to stay connected with him, to stay close to him. He grants us eternal life. He grants us salvation. He takes care of everything we have. Feed on Jesus. Remain with Jesus. Remain in Jesus. You got nothing to be worried about. This is the honor we have as disciples, to be with Jesus. This is the guarantee we get to be with Jesus, that we actually have the bread of life that will sustain us for eternal life with us every single day. We are the most blessed people on the face of this planet. Jesus would have you and I feed on him. And he says to us, as he says to the other people, don't wear yourself out working for bread that spoils. He says, it's not your job. It's not your hard work. It's not from the sweat of your brow that your rent gets paid. He's not saying quit your job. No, no, no. Do your job. But he says, I am the bread of life. I am the one who meets your needs. I am the one who's going to take care of you. So it doesn't matter what life will throw at you. Feed on the bread of life. And even as we make decisions to feed on the bread of life and to draw close to Jesus, he says this to his disciples in chapter 4. Go to chapter 4 of John as we begin to round the bend and close out. John 4.31. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his his disciples said to each other, because someone had brought him food. My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say four months more and then the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Jesus says, yes, indeed. Y'all has got to feed on me. But let me tell you something. My food, which I eat, is to do the work of him who sent me and to get the job done. That's what's going to sustain us as disciples, to bring the bread of life to a hurt and dying world that is starving. They're starving for salvation. They're starving spiritually. And you and I have the bread of life. So he says, let that consume you. Let that sustain you to take the bread of life to every single person. It's amazing to look at the world we live in today and just to see how tired, how stressed out, how overwhelmed everybody else is. And in the midst of all of that, we can have disciples of Jesus Christ who are at home, who are at peace, who are comforted, who are refuge with God. Why? Because the bread of life, Jesus is with us. Because Emmanuel, God is with us. He's the bread of life that sustains us. He's the bread of his presence that we look to every single day. He's our manna in the morning. And he says, don't keep it to yourself. There's a world of starving men and women that are dying every single day. No, not just from COVID-19. They're dying because they're starving spiritually because they got no bread. But you got the bread. Grab onto it. Feed yourself and then feed your neighbor. Why? Let's go, bro. Because God has set before us the bread of life. And just as Jesus on, told his disciples to pray every single day, pray that God would give not to you, but all of us our daily bread and to God. Be all the glory. Go, Go, Quake.